your die upon it. Thank you so much. Oh, hello. Is that working? Yes. Um, thank you so much for having me. Merci beaucoup. C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être ici. Uh, J'aurais fait ça de façon bilingue, mais je vais parler, je pense, tellement vite et essayer de couvrir tellement de choses que si je fais ça de façon bilingue, on va être ici pour uh, deux heures. Donc, um, j'ai promis à Ken de to try and stay on time. Um, but I want to thank Kent for the invitation. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, so as Kent mentioned, I'm um, a, a professor at the University of Waterloo, just outside of Toronto in Canada, and also a partner in the design practice uh, lateral office. Um, and what I'd like to do today is um, speak a little bit about uh, the research that um, is in our recent book. Um, that has, in a way, shaped uh, both our teaching and our own design work. Um, so I, 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 I want to actually first start by framing some questions that have motivated uh, our work more generally. I want to speak a little bit about the research in the book. I'm going to try and um, talk a little bit about some student work and uh, less on in terms of the design specifically, but more the methodologies that um, frame the studios, uh, and then I will hopefully be able to talk about uh, one, one or two projects um, fairly quickly of our own work. Um, so there are two questions I would say that have motivated uh, our own work in the last few years. One is, what is the role of the local in an era of globalization, and how can architecture um, mediate these sort of forces? And the second is, what are the tools and modes by which we operate in this complex field? Um, so to the first question, um, one of the things I would like to sort of offer up as a, a perhaps sort of attitude, um, is to reposition the question of vernacular because we've spent a lot of time in our own work um, in the North thinking about what might be a kind of emerging modern vernacular for, for a region where, which was essentially semi-nomadic until the 1950s. And so the kind of, there is no built tradition that, that is easily replicable. The idea of sort of reproducing igloos and teepees is simply one of sort of nostalgia and, and um, unproductive. Um, there's no, I think, going back and so the question of what is a modern northern vernacular has interested us. Um, and so I would argue that the question of vernacular needs to shift from one of purely architectural form and tectonics to an idea of spatial practice, which is um, behind our book, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and this notion of um, spatial practice, in a way, we take um, from the sociologist Henri Lefebvre's own definition in his book, The Production of Space, in which he writes, writes, the spatial practice of a society secretes that society's space. It propounds it and presupposes it in a dialectic interaction. It produces it slowly and surely as it masters and appropriates it. This suggests that users shape space through patterns of use and simultaneously adopt a system and produce its modifications. We're also um, interested in um, the landscape theorist J.B. Jackson's understanding of the vernacular. Um, and in particular, he was interested in American vernacular uh, landscapes. And he sees them as a kind of reflection and materialization of cultural landscapes and values. In his writing on the rural, the vernacular, and the seemingly sort of banal built, built environments, which he, he sort of clearly understood as being worthy of investigation and that reflect a kind of multiplicity of narratives about the people that inhabit it. And he writes, it is um, with such commonplace elements that we should begin our study. The unique features can be taken care of later. The familiar serves as a point of departure. It reassures us that however strange these landscapes may appear to be, it is not entirely alien, and it is related to every other landscape. And I think this idea of looking um, at what we might see as the kind of banal and looking at it closely and, and, and with kind of new eyes and fresh eyes is, I think, central for architects if we're going to operate in contexts that are unfamiliar to us. 
I think it's part of a kind of key of, of sort of avoiding um, the pitfalls of colonialization, which um, certainly in Canada, in the context of the Canadian North, um, uh, architecture has been very fraught, and I'll speak about that a bit more. And so um, much of our work um, has been focused on places and regions and building typologies which have been overlooked by architects. I think from the very start we were fascinated by this and I will show very quickly a kind of first research project which, which we did about 12 years ago. And I think part of the interest in studying these places is that the codes of engagement, the rules of design have yet to be written, where our understandings of public space, of collective living, of infrastructure are continually evolving. In many of these contexts, what is a public space, what is a street, what is a school or a cultural space have yet to be defined. And in many cases, and I've certainly found this in the Canadian North, we don't even have the vocabulary by which to talk about it. You can't talk about a public square in the context of Nunavut. That is a kind of entirely southern uh, or western notion, and they ha you know, that never existed. And so. It's, it's interesting talking to students that you're, you're trying to find the vocabulary at the same time that you're trying to give shape to these things. So the second question is, what are the tools or modes to operate in this field? Um, and I would say um, there are two things that have um, perhaps sort of um, helped us. Um, one is that we embrace a broad range of research. Um, it's not intra or inter or transdisciplinary, but what we've started to call undisciplined. Um, and this is, um, I mean, we all know that in the last uh, sort of decade or even two decades, there's been this sort of exciting and unruly interbreeding amongst design and spatial disciplines. Combinations of architecture, landscape, infrastructure, planning, ecology, um, urbanism have foddered new disciplinary pursuits and in some cases even new academic programs. Um, and it has opened up a kind of expanded field for design and it leads, it leads in a sense of possibility to this idea of being undisciplined. And I would say that this is not anti-disciplinary uh, nor multidisciplinary. We certainly, as, uh, at least in the case of lateral, would not pretend that we're landscape architects. We're certainly not ecologists. We're not anthropologists. Um, but we're interested in looking outside the discipline um, to, to kind of expand the questions that architecture look at, but to find the responses within the discipline. So we, we, we return back to architecture as the tools to find answers, but we look outside the discipline to kind of raise the questions. And in some ways, um, it's not to, uh, in that sense, sort of avoid the particularities of architecture, but rather to, as I say, sort of expand perhaps the agency that architecture can have. Um, and so I, I hopefully some of the work I will show later uh, uh, exemplify some of this. But one of the questions is how does one operate in this kind of undisciplined environment? And so um, we like to talk about our approach as detective work. Um, and so, that's a very terrible slide, but um, we spent a long time in our office then saying, okay, if we are detectives, what kind of detectives would we want to be? And we debated, you know, should we be Miss Marple? Should we be Columbo? Should we be uh, Magnum P.I.? We decided he made it look too effortless, uh, effortless and that seemed um, misrepresentative. Um, and so we settled on the character of Lester Freeman. And I don't know how many of you in the context of Europe know the American show that ran in um, the sort of early 2000s called The Wire. It was one of the first um, uh, sort of fairly hardcore, uh, realistic um, detective shows. Um, but there's a, there's a, and it follows this collection of detectives in Baltimore sort of trying to track the, the sort of web of drug dealers uh, taking over the city. And so there's Lester Freeman who begins his career in the sort of dustbin um, uh, of the, he's been removed from the homicide department um, and he sees his career resuscitated uh, at the beginning of the, sh the se first season because he asks such, such good questions. And he famously says in season one, you follow the drugs and you get the drug addicts and drug dealers, but you follow the money and you don't know where the F it will take you. And this idea, I think, of following the money is really very productive in the context of research, of following leads and not, not necessarily knowing the outcomes and not knowing where it will take you. Um, and I think the other thing that's interesting in terms of detective work is this idea of sort of 
following multiple leads um, and working across scales um, and, and f pursuing factors that may see a, seem outside the realm of design because I think that's where um, sometimes surprising synergies that we might not expect emerge. So I'm going to talk uh, just for a moment about um, a very early research project that we did. Um, we had gotten a fellowship at Ohio State University. I had spent six years working in Europe. Um, I came from Montreal, which is a very urban city, and I landed in middle America, and I went into the equivalent for architects of anaphylactic shock. I could not, I could not fathom this sort of vast expanses of suburbs and exurban retail corridors. Um, and I would actually cry in the middle of parking lots spontaneously and my partner and husband would have to sort of say, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I, this is shocking. Um, and, and so we, we, had, we had said we were going to study the phenomenology of glass and we got there and thought, forget glass, this is far more important. Um, and at the time, there were urban theorists talking about suburbia, people like Joel Garraud talking about Edge City and um, others, but there were very few architects looking at it as a design question. Um, and so we, we coined this sort of environment flat space, um, and we used it to characterize this proliferating urbanism of big box retail, um, which continued to change our social habits and movement patterns and understanding of place. And we understood as a specific set of landscapes, um, uh, surfaces, materials that had their very clear own operational logic and own ecologies, both environmental ecologies, social ecologies, and economic ecologies. Um, and this context of exurbia is really sort of static. Um, it's a temporal, it's non-adaptive, um, and it's also a landscape of control, of movement, of views. Um, it's a segregation of surfaces and spaces in which any potential for public space is really flattened. And so we, we so this was a sort of environment um, that we encountered. Um, and, and as I say, it had been overlooked, and what fascinated us is that there was no obvious design response. Um, and I think this is what later on motivated our, our work in the North. And so we began, we realized the first thing we needed to do is just understand what drove this environment. And so we, uh, we spent the first three months just looking at how the land is branded, the reconnaissance systems that companies use, the language that is developed, you know, spave culture and... Um, power centers, et cetera. Um, we looked at sort of analogies between uh, sort of residential uh, exurbia and, and sort of uh, retail exurbia. We looked at the kind of small fragments of public space that actually exist. So boondocking is a phenomena where you can take your RV, your sort of large recreational vehicles and park in any Walmart across America. They give you maps and you, they will give you Wi-Fi and you can plug in. And so people actually travel America in their RVs through Walmarts. Um, you can uh, tailgate, which is before football game. People bring their um, barbecues and set up shop and eat hamburgers in the middle of the parking lot. So there are these glimmers of public space, um, but of course they're sort of sporadic. And so um, we, we spent a long time trying to decipher it and, and in the end decided um, it seemed absurd to try and develop a singular solution. And so we developed nine design proposals um, that were filtered through three questions. Um, so three proposals that were looking at questions of landscape primarily, three that were driven by the questions of mobility, and three that were driven by the questions of program. All sort of potentials, uh, potential disturbances that could reactivate this world. Um, and so um, the, the I think what was also productive for us uh, in this early project was that we saw design not as a uh, a solution, but more as a question, as kind of opening up a set of further questions. Um, none of them were trying to resolve fully all the complexities. Um, and we also understood that it was a kind of fine balance between fully engaging the realities that dominate this environment, but also at certain moments suspending a little bit disbelief. Because if you completely uh, operated in the existing environment, you would s simply replicate what you have. And so this sort of, I'd say, set of approaches has framed um, in many ways all our subsequent work. Um, so Many Norths um, is in a way a kind of ongoing uh, nearly 10-year project now looking um, at the role of architecture in the Canadian North. Um, and um, most of us have uh, the kind of Canadian, the, the National Geographic image of the North, the icebergs, the 
sort of endangered polar bears. Um, but there are, um, in the context of Canada, now over 100,000 people living there. Um, there are people that, um, you know, pursue a kind of daily life. And, and very few Canadians uh, have any sort of knowledge of that reality. And certainly, um, internationally, it's, it's sort of little known. And so we started to get fascinated by, in a way, what was happening in our own backyard. And I've always loved this image. This is from a friend photographer in Toronto. Um, and it's a photograph. Um, and I think, in a way, it sort of talks about the tenuousness of existence in the North. You've got you know, infrastructure, inhabitation, mobility. Um, and they're all sort of, they, they speak to the kind of uh, attempts to inhabit the North, but also the fragility in relation to environment. Um, there's constantly the questions of climate change. We heard a lot about it yesterday. Um, in the context of the North, we hear about the retreating ice, the fact that that opens up resources, it opens up um, trade routes and mobility routes um, and of course if you're a large global corporation you're licking your lips if you're an Inuit uh, or anyone else living there um, one understands quickly the kind of dangers um, both in terms of the kind of ways of life um, but also the threats that this globalization will bring um, um, and this is a photo that we've always loved it it's in the sort of front pages of our book um, which I have here and I'm happy to share after. Um, th this is taken um, in front of a school by Papineau Gérin La Joie. They are, were Quebec architects that did some really interesting schools up in the north. Um, and you have these Inuit youth at the time that are dressed in the clothes of the day, um, that are sitting in front of this sort of slightly spaceship-like school in this um, sort of uh, what seems to us as a kind of lunar landscape. And this question that modernity was essentially foisted on the north um, and on all our indigenous people in Canada, um, and that, that architecture was largely a tool of colonialization um, and is still seen with... Um, is seen in some ways, architecture and urbanism are understood as almost antithetical to indigenous culture. And so it raises a really interesting question in my mind as an architect of how do you at the one hand try and if you see architecture as a kind of tool of cultural empowerment, when, when the very people there see it in a way as a kind of coming from a fraught and qu quite often sometimes awful history. Um, and there's a famous Inuit uh, activist, Sheila Watt Cloutier, who um, famously um, said the Inuit had gone from igloos to internet in 40 years. They're actually considered one of the people that have gone, undergone the most radical um, cultural transformation of any people in such a short time. Um, so, um, and so this is um, a, a map of uh, the circumpolar world, and, and I, wa I want to show it only to put a little bit in context the kind of range of differences across the circumpolar world. So this is northern Russia, where you have cities like Murmansk, which are 400,000 people. Um, um, uh, I'm going to forget the other name of the major city, but anyways, they, they are heavily developed. They have very large cities, very large infrastructure. You have Alaska and cities which have two million people. Anchorage is a city of, I think, two or 300,000 people. Um, and then you have the Canadian North, which is on your uh, left, um, where the largest two cities are um, 17 and 21,000. The capital of Nunavut is Iqaluit is 7,000. And then you're very quickly into communities of a few hundred or maybe a thousand at most. So you have this radically dispersed people um, with very little infrastructure um, and a whole host of interesting challenges that this raises. Um, so these are all the communities uh, north of 60 with the sort of dots representing the relative size. Um, as Kent said, Nunavut, for instance, the most recent territory is 2 million square kilometers um, and has a population of uh, 33 or 35,000 people. Um, so we began early on, this was um, early work done by students, um, simply trying to kind of document the size of the communities. And you get a sense of just how small some of the, these are. Um, and how little infrastructure they have. Um, this is Iqaluit, the capital. You start to sort of see the legacy. This was um, uh, an old uh, U.S., began as a U.S. military base, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but the lack of planning, or the lack of perceptible planning at least, um, 
uh, the fact that in, in Nunavut you don't build sidewalks, for instance, because um, you know with permafrost it's too complicated. So the whole notion of, of gradients of public space that we have are completely erased. People walk through people's backyards, you snowmobile throughout people's backyards. So there's no notion of private ownership. And so all the kind of tropes that we know as, as sort of Western architects are challenged. Um, and we've also imported southern models. So we've, we've imported sort of bungalows um, that have failed miserably, both socially and technologically. Um, the challenges of mobility um, in the eastern and central Arctic, there are no roads. Um, so the only way you get goods is by boat once or twice a year in the summer or by plane at great expense the rest of the year. So the whole challenges of building, of social infrastructure, of hosting intramural sports games, everything that we take for granted is completely challenged. And it, it starts to raise for us questions of thinking about distributed networks that in the context of, you know, if you build in Bordeaux or Toronto, you can build a cultural center and say your, your, your catchment based in you know, is, is a very large region and people will drive or take the train. But in the context of here, you know, if you build in one community, it benefits only that community. And so thinking about distributed social networks and sharing of resources becomes quite interesting as a challenge to architecture. Um, you also have this sort of um, um, emerging Inuit youth um, that are on the one hand going out hunting with their grandparents, but they're on Facebook, they're listening to hip hop, um, and they in a way speak to the kind of radical um, adaptability of these people, and that architecture has not been nearly as adaptable as the people that live there. Um, and they've also hybridized technology, so as I say, they still go out hunting at certain times, but they use GPS, they're on snowmobiles, and so they've embraced um, kind of modern technology um, in, in sort of surprising ways. There's also sort of emerging vernaculars. This was on a recent trip to Iqaluit. Um, you have, you know, these buildings um, that are raised off the ground to avoid permafrost and to let air movement. You have all the sort of um, uh, gas tanks and water tanks that sort of populate the outside of the buildings. Everything has to be built essentially as cheaply and quickly as possible. Um, there's huge housing shortages in Nunavut, tremendous overcrowding. You have um, people, 20 people living in a house of six people are time sharing beds because there's uh, such overcrowding. There's, a sh I think, in a something like 3,000 housing units short, which is, you know, if you assume each house is for four people, that's 12, in a, in a, in a, pro, in a territory of 33,000, shortage for 12,000 people, so a third of the population is effectively uh, lacking proper housing. Um, you have a kind of uh, barren landscape that pr gets produced when we build because they sort of scrape the tundra uh, uh, sort of, you know, un unthoughtfully, and yet there's this sort of rich ecology, and, and actually I have to say, having gone to the north now, I've discovered lichen is the most amazing uh, ecology one can uh, discover. It's sort of got color and texture, um, and it's also got a kind of uh, emerging architectural heritage. This is a very early Hudson's Bay station um, that's about 120 years old in Iqaluit. This is an airport also done by Papineau Gérin La Joie. Um, and these are things that I, I think um, speak also to a kind of emerging legacy now. Um, so we began um, about eight, nine years ago. We knew nothing about the North. and. Um, a bit like the flat space research began by just reading everything we could, not necessarily about architecture. Um, and so we started as a way of ordering our, our thoughts and what we were encountering, organizing our research into questions of ecology, of settlement, of culture, of resources, of monitoring and transportation. And we would develop these cue cards um, that were color coded and they kept multiplying and multiplying and they became part of a first exhibition. Um, and in a way, be became the framework for um, our book that just came out. Um, it was supposed to come out with the Venice Biennale of 2014, and the lesson is you can't produce an exhibition and a book at the same time. Um, so the book has taken several more years. Um, but the same sort of uh, categories, um, in a way, started to frame the book. And so. The book is really about um, multiple voices and multiple narratives and perspectives. And it's decidedly, I, I was speaking to a historian friend who had written a review of the book and she said, but it's not really an architectural history. You didn't go to the sources. And I said, you're right. And it, we're not historians. And we actually, 
um, decidedly didn't want to do an architectural history of the North. It's, it's, it's trying to track the forces, uh, all of the multiple forces that shape the physical environment of the North, some permanent, some ephemeral, um, and, the, and, and, and embrace this sort of idea of spatial practice. And part of um, what it tries to do is challenge what we look at as architects to inform design. Um, it aims to be broad and inclusive, perhaps unconventionally so, in terms of the themes, scopes, and methods it assumes. As the, although we are architects, we sought to document the broader conditions under which architecture has to operate. We recognize that construction logistics, cultural shifts, infrastructure, and materials are deeply intertwined. And it understands architecture among these spatial practices as operating within the landscape as a kind of range of multiple overlapping agendas. Um, and with, so most of the research is actually appropriated by others. We looked at the work of glaciologists, anthropologists, sociologists, hunters, um, and we see in a way our role um, as, as actually visualizing in many ways the patterns and techniques to represent um, these sort of spatial practices. And in some ways the argument of the book is that if we can expand um, the phenomena that we examine as architects and the tools by which we document them, we can perhaps expand the questions that we ask. Um, so I'm, so the book, um, in this idea of multiple voices, um, we develop uh, for each chapter a set of timelines that try to give a kind of initial overview, um, inevitably uh, uh, hugely oversimplified and succinct, but of things shaping that question. So in relation to urbanism, um, policies, innovations, important master plans that have happened, um, we did um, uh, interviews with specialists in each field. Um, we um, wrote our own essays. Um, we developed a, a what we call the technology matrix, which is when in our way our kind of footnotes, uh, although there are, are also traditional footnotes, that are in a way all the technologies um, that um, are part of the spatial practices. And then we developed a set of case studies, which is what I'll try and talk about um, a bit more in depth. But um, I, I would say that in this idea of many voices, um, many Norse was inspired by three um, uh, decidedly not architectural uh, influences. One is the Canadian pianist Glenn Gould's 1967 CBC radio documentary, uh, a Tr Solitude, a Trilogy. Um, uh, which was called The Idea of the North. And in it, he interviews um, five or six people that have worked and lived in the North, and they each give their sort of perspective of the North. So there's a nurse and someone uh, who's worked in the mines and so forth. And so it's this idea of multiple stories and perspectives. The second is geographer, uh, Quebec geographer Edmond Louis Admla, who wrote uh, Nordicité, Can uh, Nordicité, or in um, Canadian, or in I don't know why in English it's translated as it's your north too. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about his work in a moment, but he looks at sort of different ways to understand the Canadian north. Um, and then lastly, um, Zacharias Canuck's um, 2001 film, Atenarjwak, The Fast Runner, um, which looks at sort of, um, in a way, uh, the kind of uh, spatial practices and, and adaptability to environment and how, uh, how one occupies the north as a, a, a kind of uh, part of an, in, an integral part of the culture. So this is um, Louis Amelin's um, maps. He was a geographer and he wanted uh, to, to try and codify the different norths and he developed a set of uh, polar values um, and he would give indices for different criteria, um, numbers of heat days, how cold it was, uh, development of the economy, um, et cetera. And so if you hit a polar value of 100, you sort of ranked higher in your Nordicity and so forth. And so he talked about um, the base Canada, which you see in the lighter blue, uh, middle north, uh, far, nor uh, far north and extreme north. Um, and, um, and so he already started to recognize that there were a multiplicity of north. What's also interesting is this is a map he made where he talks about 
denortified area. So he talks about, for instance, Saskatoon as having been at the turn of the, of the 19th century of, of, of what one might call a kind of uh, near north city, quite remote. But of course today in, we would consider this kind of part of base Canada. It's a fully developed, uh, economically integral uh, community, city that is um, uh, fully infrastructurally linked. And so this idea that you can lose your Nordicity I think is really interesting. And so for a city like Iqaluit, which is now a bit of a kind of boom town, um, people are going there uh, for mining, for uh, cultural exchanges, for resources, etc. It raises the question, is it less north than its counterpart, smaller community, um, which is at the same latitude? And so this question of, is the north measurable? Is it a perceptual thing? Um, and who defines this, I think, is interesting. So we set out to do our own um, set of, of maps and tr in a way trying to kind of understand these multiple overlapping understandings of north. So you can understand it as the three northern territories. Um, territories are different from provinces and I won't get into it but they have different political jurisdiction. They are more dependent on Ottawa and the federal state. Uh, provinces have much greater autonomy. Um, you can understand it as the tax force line, which is the point beyond which you get certain tax benefits for living in difficult climates. You can understand it in terms of ethnographic lines. You can understand it as the point beyond which there are no more trees. You can understand it as the point of continuous permafrost. You can understand it as the point of the Arctic ecozone. You could understand it as the point beyond which there are no roads. You could understand it um, in terms of Amna's definitions of middle north, far north, extreme north. Um, and what you start to understand is, is the sort of multiplicity of norths. And I think for, for architects, it also frames the question of how do you define the territory that you're looking at? And that depending on the question that you're looking at and asking, the territory which you might look at will change. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the case studies. And Kent, you're gonna, can, um, I'm good. No, but I'm going to ask you. I, I've, I don't know what, what time did I start at. Uh, half hour. Okay, I'll try and move fast. Um, so I'm going to show. We we had about six case studies per chapter, and the case studies were a, an opportunity to sort of zoom in on very specific phenomena. So within urbanism, we looked at the impact of landform. Um, so we developed these sort of uh, expanded these set of um, figure grounds, looking at the relationship to water and topography. Um, and we tried to classify the sort of morphology of these communities be based on the landform impact. So sometimes you got linear settlements because they were held between coast and um, extreme topography. Sometimes you got dispersed settlements because they were sort of sitting on this pockmarked landscape. Or you would get concentrated landscapes because on, on a similar landscape, but because they were trying to avoid the complexities of geography. Um, we looked at things like the growth of a capital, um, in this case, a Calibut. So here's a kind of regional map where we looked at all the communities in Nunavut, their relative size and relative rates of growth. Um, and then looked at Iqaluit, so this is it in the sort of 1940s when it's a US um, military base camp in the Second World War. These are the very early buildings that sort of set the stages for it. Um, and so then we track it as it evolves. So early on, it of course has very little social infrastructure. I'm gonna take this so that. Um, uh, and then we see it growing and expanding its social infrastructure um, slowly but surely. Um, so this is it in the 1990s, just before it becomes the capital city, um, and this is it today. And so um, what's interesting also is um, one sees the kind of strange patterns, and this is related to topography and geology and trying to find land that is um, less complex to build on, so either avoiding extreme topographies or looking for bedrock versus uh, softer soils. And so the things that shape planning are very different than um, the things that shape planning, let's say, in Toronto or Bordeaux or or, um, uh, and so you get often, and you get the same thing in Nook in Greenland, these sort of strange sprawls because they're avoiding complex landforms. Um, so this is it today. This is actually an older photo. It's already grown quite a bit. Um, but you see some of the social infrastructure and that sort of strange no non-places. Um, in the winter, of course, snow covered, it's quite lovely. Um, when it's not snow covered, it's um, s slightly... Um, 
it's both fascinating and, and sort of grim at the same time. Um, and this is it, um, and you see it on the kind of, with the amazing bay, and you really see the kind of tundra that begins at the edge. Um, we also looked at things like northern utilities, um, so in many communities where um, you can't run pipes underground, you run them in what are called utilidors, which are above ground pipes in which you run water, uh, waste, um, and electricity. Um, so we looked regionally, um, and so one of the things actually before I continue, in all these case studies, we, we gave ourselves a kind of mandate of looking at things at a regional scale, at a local scale, and then often zoomed into a kind of very specific technology. And this idea of kind of moving across scales um, remains incredibly important to us and also in our student work, or, or the work we do with students. Um, so regionally, we were understanding what are the different energy systems and water systems. And then um, we looked at Inuvik, which was one of the first planned towns in the 1940s. They had to relocate a town because of flood. Flooding. Um, and so they developed this utilidor. This was one place where they couldn't run the pipes underground. Um, so they sourced water from a lake. Um, they had a kind of um, uh, storage lake. Um, so what's interesting about the utilidor is this was a planned town. Um, it was a bit of a gateway city, so many white people um, moved there early on. And so they ran the utilidors um, for the white people and didn't build the utilidors for the Inuit. And so from day one, infrastructure becomes uh, a kind of differentiator um, of, of uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, I've just blanked, but um, starts to divide a kind of have and have not based on ethnographic grounds. Um, what's also interesting is that the Utilidor, because it is expensive to build, created a more compact city um, than some of the others. Um, but what's also interesting is this thing that we think of as invisible in many cases here becomes highly visible and so it permeates the city. There are often walkways and boardwalks built over them and so they have a kind of real spatial uh, reality. Um, in these cities. We also, with, let's say within mobility, looked at things like sea lift, so how we get goods to the north. So they begin in places like uh, Montreal and Halifax, and this is the distribution network across the Canadian north. Um, we looked at um, how things are brought by sea lift once or twice a year. Most communities don't have a deep sea port, so the boat has to actually sh remain, at remain in the bay, and then a barge has to go back and forth, and so it takes four times as long as it should. Um, the arrival of these goods is, someone described it on a Facebook page as uh, Christmas in August, because of course suddenly, you know, the Ikea sofa you wanted, the snowmobile you wanted, the dog food you wanted, all comes up in August um, when it's delivered. The sea lift cans often get left in the communities after a while and become reappropriated as um, workshops and storage, and so they become part of the landscape. Um, we also looked at indigenous um, systems of mobility, so Inuit trails, so I shouldn't say we, we um, uh, were found the work of an anthropologist called Claudio Porta, um, who had worked with Inuit elders and GPS and done these amazing maps. So this is us redrawing simply his work. This is a lifetime of work, and there was no way we were going to be able to do this. Um, but looked at um, the different uh, notions of snow and ice, uh, the different ways that, um, or visualize the different ways that the Inuit uh, navigate on the land, um, the things they pack on a trip, um, all the tools, um, and, and uh, mobility devices that they take. Um, within monitoring, which was both military monitoring and uh, research monitoring, we looked at things like the dew line, which is um, the famous distance early warning stations that were built in the Cold War by the Americans um, to prevent the Russians. Um, under Trump, probably that would never, uh, he'd be inviting them in. Um, but. Um, we see the dew line typically as a set of dots on a map. Um, this is the way most of us know it. Um, but those dots were places, um, some of them were communities of 80 or, or 100 people. They sowed the seeds of many future permanent communities in um, the north. Um, and they developed their whole um, architectural uh, vocabulary. They, they also had cinemas and libraries for, because people were stationed there for six months or a year. Um, they developed building types. And they also, in a way, set the stage for ideas of prefabrication that linger um, to this day, probably to a fault, um, in the Canadian North. Um, and so you've got these amazing sort of um, things that, that 
kind of repeat across the north um, all the way into Greenland and now have, have become relics and are beginning to be dismantled um, and, and have left ecological repercussions as well. Within the question of resources, um, on the one hand, we looked at um, things like mining uh, in the Northwest Territories, um, so looking at the kind of location of the diamond mines, the location of permanent roads, the location of ice roads, which are these roads that are built only during the winter um, to allow trucks to deliver goods up to these ice mines. Um, we looked at the kind of amazing engineering feats that are done to extract mines from, river, from lakes, um, so huge dikes that were built um, to then be able to um, extract the, the diamonds from the middle of the lake. Um, so analyzing sort of the infrastructures, um, the calendars of delivery um, and, and occupation, um, and some of the technologies of, of how these things are kind of excavated, the dikes that were built and so forth. Um, we also, and so this is the last case study I'll show, um, looked at indigenous notions of resources. So of course things like country food. Country food is, is the traditional food that would have been hunted there. Um, and so we looked at a specific, we looked at whale hunting, we looked at mussel harvesting. Um, this is in northern Quebec. It's a set of, um, which is called Nunavik. That's a different region. Um, and there's um, amazing uh, mussel resources um, and incredibly high tides. And um, in some ways this is our, favorite case study, I think, um, because it's such a remarkable story. So you have 40-foot tides, that's uh, 15 meters every day. Um, and so the Inuit will go out, in, uh, in the summer they harvest on shore, but in the winter they go out onto the ice. Um, they dig a hole, they take their um, uh, uh, they chip a, a, a hole in the ice, they take their kamutik, their sled, to act like a ladder, they wait till the tide is low, and they descend under what is essentially an ice shelf. So the ice forms a kind of roof, becomes a kind of architecture. They descend down, um, they harvest the mussels in the three hours while the tide is low, and then they come back up. Um, so here you see the kind of geography of this ice shelf, um, and then they, there's someone that keeps watch to let them know whether the tides are coming back in, because if you don't get out fast enough, of course, you're drowned. Um, and this is a grandfather and his son um, uh, harvesting these um, har mussels. We did not take these photos. These were uh, taken by a photographer. So this, this, in a way, all of this is to say that um, there's a whole host of spatial practices. Some are permanent, some are engineered, some are designed, and some go back millennia that in a way become part of a sort of cultural and spatial landscape um, and, and might inform the way um, communities um, and architecture are envisioned. So I'm going to talk quickly um, about some uh, studios that I've run at Waterloo um, with third year undergraduate students. Um, I've gone um, uh, but but uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the structure. I'm going to flash through some images of work. Um, but I w one of the things that I talk a lot about with my students is that um, I think as architects we're taught to be inventive and to invent. Um, but I think in certain contexts um, architecture should really see itself perhaps more as an architect, uh, as an orchestrator as a tool to reveal or heighten what exists already um, and to bring spatial and cultural realities into new relationships. Um, rather than, because I think when we try and invent, um, we also uh, impose our own visions and our own cultural biases. Um, and I think this idea in a way of what many Norse was is how do we look closely at what is there and tease out from that. So in many ways I tell my students, the question is what is the least we can do? The converse of that is, at least in Canada, um, students tend to be very earnest, and so they want to do good, and they um, often start out saying, I want to solve a problem. And so the flip side to this comment is I would say, I think if you set out to solve a problem, um, you will you miss the opportunity for design invention. And so I think it's a kind of very fine, beautiful balance between learning from what is there, but also allowing yourself to be inventive once you have learned from what's there. Um, because otherwise you sort of, you, 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 the risk is that you end up producing fairly banal, you know, uh, logical architecture um, because it's doable. Um, so 
I've taken students um, over the last few years. Um, we looked, the first studio I did was looking at the Northwest Passage. Um, I hadn't yet traveled to the north, so the idea of going there seemed unfathomable, so we didn't have a field trip. Uh, and then I realized the uh, stupidity of that. Um, and so the next year, um, I took students to the Yukon in the Northwest Territories. Um, in 2012, I took um, 18 students to Greenland. Um, uh, in 2015, we went to Newfoundland, which isn't quite, uh, which is certainly not as remote, but shares certain similar challenges of small, remote, distributed communities. The difference is it's shrinking, whereas the North is growing. Um, and in a few, in a month, we're going to Northern Quebec to look at um, mining towns. Um, so the studio structure, um, our terms are very short, uh, uh, typically about 13 weeks. So we do typically two weeks of collective research. Each student is responsible for one topic. Um, and the idea is that becomes a kind of groundwork for the whole studio to share. Um, I've often, um, very early on, I developed this idea of a kind of one week charrette where they had to, I, I describe it as throwing a dart at the dartboard. I, I was worried they would spend weeks sort of thinking, well, where do I start and what should I do? And there's so much to think about. And so we just said, you've got one week, you've got a gut instinct, put it on a, you know, put it all on a poster, figure out what you think you want to do. And 90% of the time, their intuitions are pretty good. And so the next three weeks um, of design development are then spent sort of developing um, and refining these ideas. Um, and the, and the development is really uh, the first, th those next three weeks, we always ask them to look at a kind of network scale. So this, going back to this question of you can't think about a single community, um, it seems unproductive in the context of the North. So we ask them to look at a, at a kind of series of communities and what links them and how they might share resources. In between there, we do the field trip and then there's six weeks spent on the project development where they really get into the architecture. And for me, it's very important that, that they get into architecture and materials and program and, and um, bring it back to a scale that we are trained to deal with. Um, so now I'm going to get Kent to... <laughs> um, so the, the students in the research phase um, look at questions of mobility, of local economies, of education, of health, of building vernaculars. Um, and I'm, I'm literally going to flash through and I try not to give anyone um, epileptic shock. Um, it, I, don't, I just want to give you a sense of actually, it's fairly impressive what they can cover in two weeks. And this I would say is probably um, a quarter, I had to flip, remove about three quarters of what was produced. So this, this is the studio from Newfoundland, um, which as I say is, is um, somewhat different, but the work is more recent, and so I had better access to it. But um, So this is looking at the vernaculars, um, looking at um, the vernaculars of the region. There's this sort of maritime culture. It's a shrink shrinking um, uh, province that has undergone booms and busts where cod fisheries fell apart, and so the entire economy of the province fell apart. Then they had an oil boom with the kind of decline in oil prices that has shrunk. It's not dissimilar to certain uh, fishing towns in northern Norway, I think, um, from some of my uh, talks with people there. Um, so anyways, looking at vernaculars, um, looking at the tradition of moving your house um, and how a kind of typical family lot was... Um, uh, distributed, looking at the various uh, building typologies, um, looking at house moving because towns were shut down, because they um, ran out of people because of the economy, they would be paid to move to another community in a kind of effort of centralization. And so people would want to bring their houses with them and so they would put them um, on the water and tug them. Um, so they looked at different ways of house launching. This is a sort of classic photo of a family launching their house. Looking at the different outbuildings um, um, that, uh, that the houses are actually quite small, but then they have um, fishing stages and twine stores and uh, barns and root cellars for storing food um, and the outside bathrooms. And so understanding the kind of relationship to ground and building technology, even things like fences is a kind of whole vernacular. Um, someone was looking at civic architecture um, and those typologies and where they're situated in relation to topography. Um, the different kinds of, of civic architecture, the ceremonies that happen, the calendars um, by which they happen, um, the, the sort of, uh, there was the equivalent of the Freemasons, um, that they're called the orange houses, orange, um, uh, orange men in Newfoundland. Um, 
the fraternal halls, et cetera. Um, someone was looking at food security, which is um, a much bigger issue in the Canadian North, um, looking at the uh, access to local food, um, access to uh, traditional agriculture and where that's happening and the kind of exchanges that are happening, um, and the tradition of kind of uh, outport gardens. They were called victory gardens during the Second World War where people would grow their own food. Um, people looking at education, um, so the kind of networks of education in this semi fairly semi-remote province, I would say, um, that, that actually only joined Canada in 1949. So it's the latest province to join. And so it has a very distinct culture and a kind of very strong sense of independence. Um, the question of out-migration that happens as youth go to study um, in other parts of the country, the typologies of educational buildings, um, certain kind of uh, interesting educational innovations that happened in the, uh, during the uh, Second World War where there were mobile schools, um, looking at access to regional health, um, etc. So I'm actually, th there's pages and pages of it, but it was really a, a way for students to kind of understand potential issues and latch on to potential issues to then um, activate design. So now I'm going to ask you to go back to, um, so I'll, I'll very quickly show you one design uh, project from students. Um, because Newfoundland, uh, the challenge is actually that there's so much heritage built, so many heritage buildings that are in disuse, unlike most of the northern studios where the challenge was building something new. Um, in the context of Newfoundland, the question was, uh, in many cases, how to repurpose old buildings um, and, and give them new life. Um, to, uh, you know what, go to, two, uh, go to one, 110, perfect. And then you do control L. Perfect. Okay, um, so uh, I'll skip this. Um, so these are some of the field trips. This is um, uh, crossing the Arctic Circle and taking a chartered plane. Um, this is on a hike on a glacier to Greenland. And it's, it's funny, I'm about to do another one of these studios and my husband and partner sort of said, keep it simple, why do you have to do these field trips? And I, I've never dared to tell them that actually, these are the best trips I've ever done in my life. E even the ones I've, you know, better than the ones I've done with him. And they are, um, they're, 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 they're landscapes that one would never go to uh, often. Um, they're immersive, um, you, you set up meetings with planners and townspeople and, uh, you know, uh, politicians. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of way of visiting a place that's very different than sort of how we uh, are normal tourists. Um, and, and so these trips have been really uh, sublime, at least for me, uh, hopefully for the students as well. This is in Newfoundland visiting a, a boat building facility. Um, so in the network strategy phase, we asked them to look at program, at site, at stakeholders, at a kind of local narrative, um, and very importantly, questions of seasonality and temporality. Um, and so they'll, they'll be, they're asked to propose sort of multiple sites, and as I say, how things can work as a network. So this was students looking um, at a, an old uh, well, a town that had gone into severe decline, the fishing um, fish plant had closed down, so this is the kind of landscape, this is the old fish plant that is closed, um, and they decided to work on it. They also got interested, the student, had, there was a, they, we always, they work in pairs, they had looked at the tradition of the gardens together, um, and so they developed this kind of network looking at mobility, at the traditional gardens, at energy resources, um, and they were interested in, in repurposing these old fishing uh, buildings to um, develop biofuel and more sustainable energy systems, to develop um, uh, agriculture and community spaces. And I will say that, you know, programmatically, it's a, uh, at least in North America, that's a fairly familiar program type, and it's a, 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 a fraction on the banal side. I, 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 like, I don't know if I have any more projects on agriculture I can look at, um, but I think they did it incredibly thoughtfully. Um, and so they looked at the kind of whole host of communities, the range of places where you could start to redevelop this tradition of gardens, um, the stakeholders, um, both community and government and local. Um, they looked at how it might phase over time. So this was all part of the three-week uh, network phase research. They looked at inputs and outputs, both of energy, of waste management, um, uh, uh, et cetera. They looked at the kind of cast of characters that might participate, as I said. And then in the building development phase, 
Um, they took this, fish, this sort of old fishing plant um, and looked at ways that it could get activated um, through, through the insertion of biogas and various programs. Um, uh, they looked at different ideas of climate, so spaces that would be more climate controlled and less climate controlled because it was a huge building and so the idea of sort of making all of this an interior space just from an environmental purpose uh, made no sense. Um, and these were some of the kind of um, uh, uh, new, new uses that they imagined. So uh, just to have time to quickly talk about one of our own projects. Um, I think both the student work and this, this next project that I'm going to show, um, one of the questions that really interests us is how do you think at a territorial scale um, but act at a highly local scale? So thinking about large things doesn't mean designing uh, mega structures or large things. And I think um, this is important uh, to us. And so this is a project that came out of a set of six first uh, research projects that we worked on on the north. Um, and this one sort of ended up getting funded and further and further developed. And it's called the Arctic Food Network. Um, and it grew out of a, a kind of interest in the intersection of architecture, culture, and food security. Um, food security is a huge issue in Nunavut. Um, one in six children will go hungry every month. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about the term third world, but in many ways, um, people since the turn of the century have been describing our Canadian North as uh, the third world. It's actually shocking um, for a country like Canada that this um, exists. Um, and so this is a kind of study of the food basket. So as you know, a food basket is the cost of the kind of typical things you would need to live, you know, food, uh, bread, milk, eggs, in relation to your um, uh, uh, monthly salary. So Nunavut, um, which has a high rate of unemployment, it's still many people live off subsistence hunting. Most employment is through the government there's not a lot of independent economy, more than 50% of your salary is going to food. Um, and yet we recognize that there's um, a rich tradition of food, of, of seafood, of, um, uh, of hunting, of uh, berries and so forth. Um, and we started to kind of look at, I mean, this is odd for architects to do, but looking at what vitamins uh, they produced. We, I've never read so many articles on food security and nutrition in my life. Um, we looked at the kind of traditions of going out onto the land, um, of ice fishing, um, and its sort of spatial practices. Um, the emergence of kind of country m food markets. So in Greenland, it's quite common and has been historically part of the tradition of trading food. In the, in the Canadian North, you shared food. And there were community freezers. And so if you went out and hunted, you put back into the community freezer to share. But there's such a demand for country food that there's now actually a kind of economy emerging, um, which is both problematic and interesting, um, but of course no space for that to happen in. Um, we looked at the kind of infrastructures of food that already exist, so these community freezers. So they began as underground freezers that you see on the far right. Um, now they build these nasty metal freezers that leak Freon after 10 years and cost millions of dollars just to maintain. There's some tradition of greenhouses, um, which is, um, some have been successful it's an interesting question. Uh, Canadian students love to propose greenhouses in the Canadian North. I was on a jury recently, um, and I, uh, there was a uh, mayor fr from Nunavik who was there, Inuit, and I asked him how he felt about it, and he said, I won't say anything, but we are meat eaters. And, and I think that, and this project also includes greenhouses, but I, I, I think one, one really has to be careful about the biases one brings. I mean, they are buying fruit and vegetables, and so in some ways it makes sense, but it is also a kind of cultural imposition. And so the kind of de facto assumption that this is a good thing should at least be questioned. Um, there's wayfinding, there's hunting cabins that are pretty perfunctory um, that are built. Um, this is in northern Quebec, so you wouldn't get this density, but this is the sort of tradition of ice fishing cabins. Um, and these are these amazing underground freezers, which no longer exist, but um, they're just or sort of only for historical purposes. But they would dig with um, uh, uh, sh shovels, really, 30 meters into the ground and use the natural permafrost as a freezer. We looked at the kind of systems of mobility uh, that historically and still exist. Um, and then I was telling you about Claudio Porta, this geographer who had mapped, oops, uh, 
all the Inuit trails um, traditionally used for hunting. Um, and this became important to our work. We also documented all the sort of um, food resources that exist and started to map them. So what we did is we made a map that showed where the food resources were, where the Inuit trails were, and where the communities were. And we wanted to see um, where these might intersect. And so we created a calendar um, where the dark is where these food resources already are accessible, and the hatch is us speculating on, through a set of architectural interventions, perhaps we could extend the kind of um, uh, window of opportunity of access to that traditional food. And I should say that the ambition was not to say, you know, no one will shop at a grocery store anymore, but simply to kind of um, enhance the tradition of country food. There's huge issues of obesity um, because they import poor country food, uh, poor southern food because fruit and vegetables cost a fortune. I've been up there, um, a, a, you know, a, a melon is $20, uh, tomatoes are $10. So that is not what, what they're eating. They're eating Twinkies and potato chips. And so all the health issues come with that. And so the, the, this project is really saying, can we simply slightly redress the balance? So we made a map and started to imagine a kind of potential sort of exchange where one community might have access to, let's say, caribou could perhaps share with the next community that had access to uh, Arctic char or whatever it might be. Um, so this was this kind of idea of trade. Um, and part of the project was also a kind of economic argument that um, Right now, we import food from the south. It gets more and more expensive as you head north. Um, and could this project produce a kind of local economy that is much more about intra-trade and, if anything, might produce a micro-export to the south? Um, and so we developed this sort of kit of parts um, uh, um, of, of different uh, elements that might be part of this kind of food network. Um, so cabins, uh, meshes, poles for wayfinding, uh, meshes for aquaculture, uh, vaults for underground food storage, etc. Looked at how they might cluster in different ways. So in a town, you might get bigger ones like the market and the greenhouse and a community kitchen. Um, out of town, you might get a, a smaller kitchen and a and a fishing cabin. Um, so this was a view of one of them out on the land. Um, this is a slightly ambitious version of many of them. I don't think you'd ever get this many. Um, but it was a way to kind of explore some of the tectonics, and I'll talk about that very quickly. So part of what we were interested in is both culturally, could you hybridize traditional uh, and modern food culture, and also architecturally. So we looked at, on the one hand, um, a wood structure that was partly CNC milled and partly just using traditional wood, wood um, cladding, uh, 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 wood framing, um, but that would be tied through a traditional system of kamutik. They, they build their um, sleds through tying of the rope, and so we were interested in reviving that tradition. And then for the skin that um, Two, two sides would actually be snowpack, so in the winter you would have the kind of insulative value of an igloo, and in the summer it would breathe, um, and you might just cover it with a tarp for wind, but that the second skin was a kind of um, metal and solar uh, voltaic uh, skin, and there are many innovations on solar, uh, solar panels happening. Um, and so this was the sort of Camutique tradition, um, and this is a view of one of these interior collective kitchens, um, and one of the fishing cabins. So I'm going to wrap up this. Um, the, um, we're also interested in how you would go out onto the land and build it. There are no roads, so it had to be um, transportable on sleds and buildable by three or four people over a few days. So we sort of looked at some of the logistics. Um, and then we, we got to the point of community consultations. We developed, inspired a bit by an Inuit game of, of planning how to lay out your community by throwing bones and laying it out. Um, we developed this sort of set of chess pieces of the different components and the idea is that we would go into communities and say, here's a range of possibilities. What might you want? Where might you want them? Um, rather than sort of imagining we knew because we, we knew we didn't. And so these were these sort of chess pieces um, larger ones, much smaller ones. Um, we also developed a, a framing model to get input on, on the kind of construction system and whether it made sense. Um, we went up into two communities. This is in Sanikilowak. Um, this is with students who are very amused. Um, unfortunately, um, so we got 
generous funding from Wholesome. Um, we were, of course, willing to kind of put our time and energy. We ran into roadblocks in terms of governance, um, which I think is an ongoing issue in, from working with graduate students in all countries. Of It's one thing to build it. It's then the question of who cares for it, who will maintain it, who takes ownership. Um, and so this project, unfortunately, um, is on hold. I, I'm not going to talk about the last project, but I, I think for us, the to kind of wrap up, um, one of the, um, sorry, uh, I think one of the kind of key questions is um, how do we expand the sort of agency of architecture? And coming from North America where the architect has been reduced to <laughs> something less than nothing, uh, I would argue, um, the, 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 the question of how we might expand our agency I think has partly motivated this idea that we would do the research and we would come up with possible solutions. And, and it's interesting, I presented this project and someone said, well, what's important to you in this project? And I thought about it and realized the forms don't matter, that in a way for me, what, if, if this were to ever get implemented, the strategy I think is one that hopefully has value, the, the, the kind of perhaps strategy of how to deploy them um, and the programs. The forms are really not the, the kind of lasting value of the project. And so I think figuring out where architecture um, has real value in contexts unfamiliar to us, I think, is uh, really interesting. And I'll, I'll close with, um, Kent made an interesting comment yesterday. He said, um, architects acting upon the world. And I think there's truth in that, but maybe I'll, I'll flip that and say, I think that also um, perhaps sometimes in these contexts, the question is, how do we get acted upon? Um, and, and I think the question of going in with humility and with very open eyes um, and with almost a kind of sense of awe of the kind of surreal difference that um, we are confronted with um, opens up real opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>